in the Word of God, we continue our studies in Romans at the third chapter, reading there from the 27th verse and right through into the middle of uh, chapter 4. In the first half of chapter 3, has been speaking about uh, justification by faith as the only way to get right with God. And uh, he sets that <coughs> way of faith over against the way of good works. And uh, it's at that point that we break into the argument uh, at verse uh, 27 of uh, chapter 3. What then becomes of our boasting if the only way to get right with God is by faith in Jesus Christ? What becomes of our boasting, of our good works, and our churchmanship, and our religion? Where do they stand? It is excluded. On what principle? On the principle of works? No, on the principle of faith. For we hold that a man is pronounced righteous by faith apart from the works of the law, having nothing to do with being good or obeying the Ten Commandments. But is God the God of the Jews only? Is this way of getting right with God only for Jews? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. And God will pronounce righteous the Jews, circumcised, on the ground of their faith, and the uncircumcised, the non-Jews, through their faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And here is an illustration of how the Old Testament upholds justification by faith. What then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by his good works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6? Abraham believed God, and it his belief, his faith, was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, to the man who works, his wages are not reckoned at the end of the week as a gift, but as his due. And to the man who does not work, but who trusts the God who pronounces righteous the ungodly, that man's faith is reckoned as righteousness. And what about David, the king of Israel? And so also David, in the 32nd Psalm, pronounces a blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from good works. And this is what the 32nd Psalm says. Happy are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Happy is the man against whom the Lord will not reckon his sin. Is this blessing of justification by faith pronounced only upon the Jews? 
circumcised or also upon the Gentiles, the uncircumcised. Well, we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. Well, how was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after Abraham had been circumcised? In other words, was it before he became a Jew, medically speaking, technically, technically speaking? Was it before or after Abraham had become a Jew? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. Abraham received circumcision later on as a sign or a seal of that righteousness which he already had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. And the purpose of all of this was to make Abraham the father of all who believe without being circumcised and who thus have righteousness reckoned to them and in the same way the father of the circumcised, the Jews who are not merely circumcised but who also follow the example of the faith which our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word and grant us an understanding of it. The last question uh, at the tail end of chapter 3 of Romans, at the 31st verse, do we then overthrow the law by this faith, is the prelude to chapter 4 of Romans. And in fact, chapter 4 is the answer to that question. And you must now imagine this question being asked by a Jew who has been absolutely shocked and uh, scandalized by some of the things that Paul has been saying in Romans chapters 1 to 3. Because if what Romans 1 to 3 is saying is true, then at first sight Paul has just swept away the whole of the Old Testament, including the law of God. Now you remember that in the first three chapters of Romans, Paul has been trying to establish two major points of the gospel. The first is the universality of the sin of man. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks after God perfectly. There is none who does good, no, not one. There is a universality in the sin of man. And Paul illustrates this by holding up in these uh, first three chapters three men as uh, classic examples. The first of these men is the godless pagan, the man who lives a thoroughly immoral life. And you find that man in the second half of chapter 1. The second man is the godless pagan who lives a moral life. He's still not a Christian. He still doesn't believe in God. But his life is upright and clean. And you read about him in the first half of chapter 2. And the third man is the religious man. 
represented by the Jew with all his privileges and his Bible and the Old Testament sacraments and his knowledge of how God is to be approached and worshipped. The godless pagan and his immoral life. The godless pagan and his moral life the religious man. And Paul concludes that all these men are guilty in the sight of God. They are all estranged and alienated from their maker. They are all adrift from the only true anchorage of life and of hope. There is a universality in the sin of man. It uh, happens <coughs> that the sins of these three men differ from each other. After all, the sins of a godless, immoral man are uh, different from the sins of a godless, moral man. And the sins of a godless, moral man are different from the sins of a religious man. Their sins are different, but their sin is common, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the religious man, the man who is pious and devout, but who is still unconverted, and unsaved and unredeemed, the religious man comes under the same condemnation as the other two men. These three men are all in the same boat because of the universality of uh, human sin. The second point that Paul is trying to establish in these uh, first three chapters of Romans is this, that there is only one way to get right with God, and that is the way of faith. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ is the only way to God. It's the only way home. And faith in the finished work of Christ stands over against all other ways by which men try to get right with God, and particularly the way of good works. It is simply not possible to get right with God. It is not possible to be reconciled to God by keeping the Ten Commandments. God never intended the Ten Commandments to be a way of reconciliation with himself. As uh, uh, God says in uh, chapter 3 and verse 20 of Romans, no human be being will be justified in God's sight by the works of the law. In other words, being good cannot get you to heaven when you die. Living a straight, upright, clean, moral life can not and does not win favor with the God. The only way to be reconciled to God is through the death of his Son, Jesus uh, Christ. Uh, not only can we not get right with God by good works. Uh, way back in chapter 2, Paul says, we cannot get right with God by sacraments. Because uh, in uh, chapter 2, Paul deals a blow to those who trust in sacramental things to see them all right with God. Listen to these words from chapter 2 and at verse uh, 25 circumcision and that was the Old Testament sacrament equivalent to baptism circumcision indeed is of value 
if you obey the law. <coughs> but if you break the law, <coughs> your circumcision or your baptism becomes uncircumcision or unbaptism. It is as if you'd never been circumcised or as if you'd never been baptized. And so, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Verse 28, For he is not a real Jew who is one outwardly. It's not a question of circumcision and going through the performance. He is not a real Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is he a real Christian who is one outwardly. Nor is true circumcision or true baptism something external and physical. But he is a real Jew and he is a real Christian who is one inwardly. And real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. This man's praise is not from men, but from God. In other words, to put that into New Testament terms, baptism and the Lord's Supper cannot of themselves bring a man to God. Only justification by faith can bring a man to God. Sola fide, by faith alone. One of the watch cries of the Reformation. Faith in the finished work of Christ is the only way to get right with God. And so you must imagine a Jew standing at the end of chapter 3, rather bewildered and rather angry by all these arguments, and saying, but if what you're saying is true, this is outrageous. This is scandalous. You've just swept away the Old Testament. You have swept away the sacraments. You have swept away the moral law of God. If the moral law of God cannot bring me to God, and if sacraments cannot bring me to God, are you sweeping them all away? And so Paul turns gently to this Jew at the end of chapter 3 and he says, Do you believe the Old Testament? And of course the Jew says, Of course I do. I'm a child of Abraham. I believe the Old Testament. Then Paul says, Listen to what the Old Testament says about Abraham. And listen to what the great King David says in the Old Testament. And so chapter 4 of Romans is the answer to this question asked by an angry Jew at the end of chapter 3. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? In other words, do you sweep away the Old Testament by the principle of faith in Jesus Christ? And so in a stroke of brilliance, Paul uses Abraham, the father of the Jews, and David, the king of the Jews, to show that justification by faith alone is the Old Testament way to get right with God, and it's the only way to get right with God. And uh, I believe that for Christians there are two great lessons here. From Romans chapter 4, the first concerns evangelical method and the second concerns evangelical message. The first then, evangelical method. Suppose there's someone you want to reach or influence for Christ. How do you do it? Are you a, a confrontational sort of person? Do you believe in head-on collisions 
with the ungodly. Preach, 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 preach. A barrage of the word of God. Are you a confrontational Christian? Well, it's not always the best way. And it wasn't always Christ's way. Romans 4 teaches that one of the highest forms of evangelical method is to come alongside the person and stand where he stands and start where he stands and identify yourself with the person. That's the great word. Identify. Come alongside the person and deal with the person from the inside, standing on his ground. And that's what Paul does in Romans chapter 4. Let me illustrate this from the life of Jesus. It's what Jesus did with the woman of Samaria. In John's Gospel, chapter 4, although she was a highly immoral woman, she was very interested in religion and theology. And uh, she started talking to Jesus about religion and theology. She sure picked her man, didn't she? Why, why does a Jew like yourself uh, speak to a Samaritan like me because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, said this uh, very theological lady. And she said, you Jews worship God in Jerusalem and you say that's where God should be worshipped. But uh, we Samaritans, we worship God in Samaria and, and we say that's where God should be worshipped. What are your views on this? And Jesus listened to her. And he came alongside her. And he stood where she stood with her interest in religion and theology. And he started where she stood. And he evangelized from the inside That was how he tackled Zacchaeus, wasn't it? The wee manny who climbed the tree to see this important rabbi passing by. You see, it would have been so easy for Jesus to harangue the little twister about his sins, the way he swindled the poor with his tax gathering and lined his own pockets and feathered his own pretty little nest. But Jesus ignored the confrontational approach because Jesus saw something in Zacchaeus that I saw only yesterday. He saw that the man was a social climber. Did you notice that only the important people were invited to his dinner? He liked to have the right people dine with him. The Pharisees and the religious people, the right people. And Jesus saw that the man was a little social climber. And so Jesus invited himself for dinner. And he started where Zacchaeus was. And he stood where Zacchaeus stood and he evangelized the man from the inside. Let me give you a modern example of this. How do you tackle Mormons? Well, I'm afraid that most of us don't tackle Mormons at all. We send them away and shut the door. Or we say, well, thanks for calling. We're already members of a church and we turn them away but there is a way 
to reach Mormons. They have to be evangelized from the inside. First of all, don't quote the Bible to a Mormon because Mormons believe that the authorized version of the Bible is the Word of God. But they also go on to say it's the Word of God only insofar as it is correctly translated. And that means, of course, that if a verse doesn't suit them or if it clashes with Mormonism, they can always say, well, that verse is incorrectly translated. And you would really need to know Hebrew and Greek to put them right on the doorstep. First of all, don't quote the Bible. Secondly, remember that for a Mormon, the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. And it's on the same level as the Christian Bible. And what Mormons do is, they come to the Christian Bible and they lift out words such as salvation and redemption and church and heaven and sin and so on but they give them a completely different meaning from the meaning we understand that's why when a Mormon thinks about Jesus Christ he doesn't think about Jesus Christ as we think about Jesus Christ when a Mormon thinks about God he doesn't think about God as we think about God you see Mormons think of God as a man with arms and legs and a real body a man who has probably been married thousands of times a polygamous man that's the Mormon view of God. Uh, Mormons believe that in the Garden of Eden, Adam was God. They believe that at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, that was probably the wedding of Jesus, who was being married to Martha and Mary. Mormons believe that one day all Mormons are going to become gods. That's why they live such strict lives down here on earth. They're training to become gods. Mormons believe in hell. But the only people who will be in hell are former Mormons who have renounced the Mormon religion, the black sheep of the Mormon church. They are the people who are going to be in hell. You see, you cannot argue with Mormons on that ground because the Book of Mormon is on the same level as the Christian Bible. You cannot come near a Mormon in that way. The only way to reach Mormons is from the inside. Read the Book of Mormon. I could give you a copy if you're interested. It's a very dull book. It's very boring stuff. It was given to me by a Mormon in Salt Lake City. Read the Book of Mormon and become familiar with it and see what it says. And then discover that most of the things Mormons believe today are not found in the Book of Mormon. In fact, many Mormons today very rarely read the Book of Mormon. What Mormons believe today is a kind of hodgepodge of the sayings of Mormon elders and the traditions handed down by Mormon fathers and so on. But if you read the Book of Mormon and then confront Mormons with it you stand where they stand and you start where they stand and you can evangelize them from the inside I wonder if you know that lovely verse in Ezekiel 
which says, I sat where they sat. The Jews were in bondage in Babylon, and they were under the judgment of God. They were very disheartened and discouraged because they were far away from their land, and the temple was in ruins, and worship as they'd known it had come to an end. And Ezekiel was in Palestine. And it would have been very easy for Ezekiel to send a message to Babylon saying, well, uh, cheer up. It uh, might have been worse. Yours sincerely, Ezekiel. But instead of sending a message from a distance, he went to Babylon and he mixed with them. And that's why you get this verse. I sat where they sat. And he identified himself with them and with their needs from the inside. And he brought them good news from the inside, sitting where they sat. And you know, that is a great art. Acquiring that kind of evangelical method. And that's what Paul does here in uh, Romans uh, chapter 4. He says to the Jew at the end of uh, chapter 3, do you believe the Bible? The Jew says, of course I, I believe the Bible. It's what God says. Well, says Paul, Look at what the Old Testament says about Abraham. Verse 3 of chapter 4. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Verse 5. To the man who does not work but trusts the God who justifies the ungodly, that man's faith is reckoned as righteousness. In verse 6, David in the Old Testament, do you see what David says in the 32nd Psalm? Verse 7, happy are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Happy is the man against whom the Lord will not reckon his sin. Do you believe the Old Testament? Look at Abraham. Look at David. That's what the Old Testament teaches. Justification by faith. Evangelical method. Get to the inside and start from the inside and bring the person to faith and to Christ from the inside. Stand where the person stands. That's evangelical method. And the second thing is evangelical message and uh, that's important too isn't it there's no point in having a method if you don't have a message the method of the gospel is the how of getting Christ across to sinners who stand in need of grace the message of the gospel is the what it's the content of the gospel. And it's important to have a message as well as a method. What would be the value of having a thousand magnificent methods of communicating Christ if you had no Christ to communicate? Message and method stand together. Well, what is the message of Abraham? Can you imagine a timeline? A time scale? At the start of the line, put Abraham, father of the Jews. When did Abraham get right with God. When was he justified? By faith alone. Imagine the man standing there 
worshipping the sun and the moon and the stars, just like all the other Babylonians. And there, at the start of this line, he hears the voice of God saying, Trust me! Trust me! And I'll give you three things. A land, a great name, and a seed without number. Trust me. And so at the start of the line, Abraham trusted God, and in that act of trust, he became right with God, and God reckoned righteousness to him. Fourteen years before he was circumcised. In other words, fourteen years before he became a Jew, Abraham was right with God. Listen. Four hundred and thirty years before the giving of the Ten Commandments, Abraham was right with God. So you see, he could not possibly have got right with God through a sacrament because the sacrament didn't come until 14 years after he trusted God. And he could not possibly have got right with God by obeying the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments weren't given for another 430 years. Abraham was still a heathen when he was justified by faith. And that's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. Will you turn to this in closing? It's a marvelous bit of exegesis. Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Galatians is earlier than Romans by the way, although it comes after Romans in our Bible, Galatians was written before Romans. Chapter 3 and verse 6. And Paul's quoting the same verse from Genesis 5, <coughs> Genesis 15, Thus Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And so you see, it is men of faith who are the children of Abraham. <clears throat> and the scriptures, foreseeing that God would pronounce righteous the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations, the Gentiles, the outsiders, be blessed. And so then, those who are men of faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. For all who rely on the works of the law to see them right with God, are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no man is pronounced righteous before God by the law. For Habakkuk says, He who through faith is righteous shall live. Verse 17, this is what I mean. The law, the Ten Commandments, which came 430 years afterwards, after Abraham was justified, does not annul this covenant of grace previously ratified by God with Abraham so as to make the promise void. 
For if the inheritance of eternal life is by the law, it is no longer by promise. But God gave this to Abraham by promise and not by law. Jesus once said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. Abraham rejoiced to see the coming Christ because he got right with God through faith in the coming finished work of Christ. And that's the start of the timeline. Abraham, 14 years later, the sacrament. 430 years later, the law. And the end of the line. Well, if you are a Christian, the end of the line is you. Because the whole purpose of this, Paul says, was that Abraham should become not simply the father of the Jews, but the father of Christians, believing Christians as well as believing Jews are blessed in faithful Abraham because Abraham is the father of all who believe. Let me end simply like this this morning. There are only two sorts of people in the church today. There are only two sorts of people in the world today. There are only two sorts of people in all of human history. Those who are right with God through faith in Jesus and those who are not. Those who have Abraham for their spiritual father and those who have not. Because nothing is more certain than this. If you want Abraham as your progenitor in the faith, if you want Abraham for your spiritual father, you must give up your good works, and give up your boasting, and give up your churchmanship, and give up your religious pedigree, and lean on God as he did and trust in God as he did and your trust will be reckoned to you for righteousness and you will go home this morning justified by faith Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the preaching of his word.